Hi, um, we'll get started. People can join as they come on. Um, I'm, I'm doing this format and then I'm gonna record this so I can give it to everyone afterwards. <clears throat> so I'm gonna leave it to ask questions when we're all done, okay? So I'll leave time at the end for a question and answer period. So tonight's seminar is gonna be about concussion, concussion management and about the changing approach to concussion and uh, how I would recommend you take a look at concussions, how potentially if one day your son or daughter has a concussion, how you would manage it. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm a certified impact consultant. Impact is, well, it's probably one of the most widely used uh, cognitive computer tests related to concussion. I think I believe it's still used by all the major sports in North America. Um, I'm a featured speaker on impact test applications in their uh, continuing education program. Um, I'm a member of the um, Complete Concussion Management Network, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I've been in clinical practice for over 28 years, and concussion management has kind of been a, uh, a key part of it for the last 15 years just in the necessity of dealing with a lot of athletes and having a lot of concussions come into me, that's kind of how this became a part of my practice. Um, I'm a licensed chiropractor and an AK practitioner in chiropractic. And um, over the years, I mean, I've performed over 3000 cognitive baseline tests, as well as managing multiple concussions. When I say manage and we'll talk about that tonight. I'm not talking about just monitoring someone. I'm talking about taking them from the point of concussion to discharge and return to play and actively making that happen on a timeline. Um, the Complete Concussion Management Network is probably today one of the largest clinical networks of concussion um, across the globe. Um, I believe we've got more clinics uh, combined together in, in um, collaboration. Uh, right now, I think it's probably the largest um, database of concussion um, information coming in worldwide. Um, the advantage I see as it is that there's a medical advisory board, which leaves me to be free as a clinician. And I've got a group of experts who are constantly combing through the research and constantly making sure that we as clinicians are always doing what's up to date and concurrent. And that's the one agreement we all come to board with is that we all have a base agreement of what we're going to do as, as, as a practice so that we're all consistently doing the same thing. There's always the same type of baseline. If for example, you're at a, way in a, at a tournament in Chicago, you can see a CCMI clinic in Chicago, and they're going to have access, not only access to the data, but they're going to approach things in the exact same manner. So concussion issues in sport. Concussions are one of the most prevalent injuries in sport and can have a serious impact on a developing brain, hence why it's really important we talk about it with kids. Um, up to 30% of high-risk athletes receive a concussion each year. So I mean, that, that's kind of deceiving because people think of football and hockey as high risk, but yet um, soccer, I think, is the most prevalent sport for concussion in sport. And just to give you an idea, I think at any given time, 25 to 30 uh, percent of all uh, synchronized swimming athletes are concussed. 50 percent of concussions in sport are not recognized or reported. Research shows that one concussion is not associated with any serious long-term impact. However, a second concussion prior to full recovery from the first one is shown to cause potential permanent, even fatal damage. Hence why the Rowan's Law legislation in Ontario. This means that concussions are not necessarily the problem. The current issue is the improper management of concussion. In fact, concussions are treatable and often result in full recovery. 
So it's the mismanagement of concussions that can cause permanent or long lasting issues. And despite the prevalence of these injuries, unfortunately, most healthcare practitioners don't have any specific concussion training. And the topic is generally, well, not generally, the topic is not covered in medical and allied healthcare curriculums. I've done this postgraduate work outside of school. Um, and, and to be fair, um, the average practitioner, I mean, what I was doing 15 years ago with concussion and what the research said I should be doing 15 years is not what it says today. So it's a constantly evolving and changing field. And uh, concussion management is not extensively covered in medical and allied health curriculums, as I said. So concussion, a definition. Well, often you'll often hear it referred to as mild traumatic brain injury. And it's an injury affecting the brain induced by traumatic or biomechanical forces. Most common mechanism is not actually a direct blow to the head, but actually whiplash. There's no damage to brain anatomy, hence why CAT scans and CT scans and MRIs are, well, useless. They're not gonna tell you anything about concussion. They're used for other purposes. Disturbance, there's a disturbance in brain metabolism, specifically with regards to energy production in the brain. Most, in fact, at least 90% or more of all concussions involve no loss of consciousness. So just because someone's knocked out has no bearing on whether there's a concussion or not. As I said, there's no radiological evidence. So x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs are not, not only not needed, they're not useful to the diagnosis or management of con concussion. An additional or repeated injury before the initial injury is resolved, that's what can result in very serious injury. And that's what we're going to focus on talking throughout tonight. And to that point, and this is why we need to look for more objective means of dealing with concussion, concussion symptoms often disappear in seven to 10 days, but the injury persists for long after that. So the reason why I bring up Sidney Crosby is I think most hockey fans can remember how concussions caused Crosby to be out of the NHL for almost two years. And most of us can remember what was occurring during that. If you're a hockey fan, um, he initially got clipped and got hit hard, rocked in the outdoor game, the uh, winter classic. And you could see he got dazed. He kind of stumbled off the ice. He was out of it. Clearly, he got his head rocked. Um, but he came back within a couple games. And the, in, in those up and coming couple games, it was a routine hit up against the boards. I mean, the type of hit that's kind of routine in hockey, certainly one that he's received and given out many, many times. But yet that was the hit that seemingly insignificant, unconsequential hit is what caused him to be out for almost two years. And that's the problem with concussion and mismanagement of it. So there's three primary concerns that we'll cover tonight. One is second impact syndrome, and that's what I was just referring to that happened to Crosby. Second is persistent symptoms, because contrary to popular belief, a large percentage of of people who get a concussion don't resolve their symptoms. And the third one, I'm gonna bring about more just because of what's been brought about in the media and obviously concerns parents have with their kids being involved in hockey or any other um, contact sport and that's CTE, chronic traumatic encephalitis. So number one, second impact syndrome. I mean, in the end, Fundamentally, we need to change the culture, culture of sport as it relates to head injuries. I mean, I'm coming from an era and many parents around my age, even younger. I mean, when I played football in university, you, you got your head rocked and, you know, someone put up their fingers and said, how many fingers? And he said, I have four or three. And 
close enough. Come on, get out there, go, go for it. Right. I mean, I'm certain I suffered quite a few concussions through university playing football that I, I still to this day suffer some problems with. Um, but a mild traumatic brain injury is not mild. That's the key. Doesn't matter. Like the one thing you should learn as a parent, because I, I this is what I've seen in my practice, is whether or not I've gotten by with plenty of concussions. That's true. I've actually been quite lucky. We've heard testimony from a lot of professional athletes who mismanaged concussion and how many ways it affected their lives, um, their marriages, their their relationships, their careers, um, and, and, and led to many other problems in their life. And we've heard that throughout professional sports with a lot of athletes coming forward. Hence why, you know, I'm going to say this a couple times so tonight. If I was to choose between getting a concussion and getting a, like say, an ACL tear, I would choose the concussion because if it's managed properly, it can be inconsequential. inconsequential. And you can get back, the kid can get back to, to play, well, as quickly as seven days maybe, but, but certainly within 30 days. So one of the key problems is returning to sport too soon. So what happens in concussion is there's an energy deficit. So when the hit occurs, we have a, a drop. Well, we have a drop in blood flow because with, uh, with a, any injury, there's inflammation. And normally with inflammation, you'd have swelling. Well, in the brain, you can't allow for swelling because there, there's a skull. And so what we have is we have a drop in blood flow and then we have an a increased demand for glucose, for energy, but yet a drop in energy production, right? And this mismatch leads to a real problem in, in cellular dysfunction in the brain. So another way to think about it, if this on the y-axis is brain energy levels, and this is timeline, when the hit occurs, you have a dramatic drop in energy levels in the brain, not to the point of causing cell death or problems, but you have a dramatic drop in energy production. And then usually around the seven to 10 day mark, most, if not all symptoms go away. And at that point, that's where energy production start to climb up, right? Until they reach normal. And this occurs usually in and around 30 days. Sometimes it can occur but a little bit less, but generally research is showing us now that it's occurring around a 30 day mark. There's ways to measure that. And we're gonna talk about that, but that's considered generally 30 days. But if within that time period where this green line, there is no symptoms and the athlete returns to play and gets hit like Crosby did in his second hit, then the brain is very susceptible and vulnerable to injury at that point. And there's a dramatic drop in energy again, even to the point that it can start to get in the realm of causing some cell death and damage. And then the return recovery now back to normal energy levels is an extended period that can last months, technically speaking, even years. And again, if they get hit in that time, it keeps on dropping. And this problem just keeps on compounding until at one point they just never recover from symptoms. And that is what's happened with a lot of ex-pro athletes because they never managed the concussions. And speaking from experience, I had a lot of problems all throughout the rest of my university days, all through chiropractic college and even into the first decade or so of my professional life. And again, I emphasize Symptoms gone, but a very vulnerable period where the brain can't get hit again. So returning to sport too soon. Um, I, I mean, I could bring up a lot of different research articles and I'm not gonna do that for the purposes tonight, but just enforce the fact that this is not just opinion. This is research-based and there's lots of evidence in the peer-reviewed published research. 
But out of this article, the data strongly reinforces the public health concern that too rapid a return to activity after a traumatic vein injury can induce permanent damage and even disability and technically even death. Recent literature suggests that the physiological time of recovery may outlast the time for clinical recovery. The consequences of this is athletes may be exposed to additional risk by returning to play while there is ongoing brain dysfunction. And this is taken from the most recent uh, international consensus statement on concussion in sport. Uh, there was scheduled to be one usually about every um, three or four years. This was in 2016. So the next one was scheduled to be in 2020. And obviously everybody knows what happens happened then. And I think the next one is coming up this year. But that's where there's a large international symposium of doctors, researchers, clinicians, all coming together, discussing the research and putting together protocols on concussion management. And from that, see, this is what kind of give you visually what I'm talking about. So we have a pre-injury, normal cerebral function. Then a concussive event happens, an injury. And you have a window here of vulnerability to the brain. In this acute phase, you have symptoms, but then the symptoms resolve and go away. But then during this phase, even though the symptoms are gone, you still some, have some ongoing physiological problems and that recovery process is occurring. And if an athlete returns to play during this period of time, that's when we're going to end up going back here. And now this process becomes larger, more complicated, and more problematic. So what we're looking for is we need to have both a clinical recovery and a full physiological recovery where the brain becomes back to normal. And that's a prevention-based return to play. And that requires objectivity. It requires measurement. It requires certainly much more than asking the athlete how they feel. So based on that, objectivity and trying to develop a return to play, simple question. How do you know what or where you are trying to get back to if you don't know where you started? where you are in the maze. That's the essence of baseline testing. So what is baseline testing? First of all, it's a procedure. It's not a test. No one single test is effective on its own. Multimodal testing is critical. So that should involve a battery of tests that test various areas of the brain and brain function, cognitive and physical. Have a good test retest reliability for at least six months to a year and have good longevity after injury. In other words, being able to show subtle dysfunction even after symptoms go away. The purpose of baseline testing, it's not to diagnose. I don't need a baseline test to diagnose. Diagnose is primarily based on a mechanism of injury and symptoms. A baseline test is primarily used for assisting in making a safe return to play decision. In other words, a safe and objective full clearance stage, knowing when the athlete is actually returned to what they're like prior to injury. Now, I'm gonna bring this up because there's one group specifically in the GTA, um, Parachute Canada, which, Oftentimes, especially uh, I've noticed within the GTHL is often said in other sports, baseline testing is not necessary and baseline testing is useless. And beta well, bottom line is there, there are, are quite a few international well-known associations who, who have statements on baseline testing. The only one in the entire world that doesn't support or suggest baseline testing is this one. The International Consensus Statement on Concussion in Sport. That's the largest international group of scientists, research clinicians ever assembled in the world, all coming together from different countries and making a statement. 
Concussion Sport Australia position statement, Canadian Olympic and Paralympic concussion guidelines, Centers for Disease Control, the NCAA Diagnosis and Management of Sport-Related Concussion Best Practices Handbook, the National Athletic Trainers position statement, and I can include with that the physiotherapy guidelines, Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation guidelines, proceedings for International Ice Hockey Summit, Bottom line is all the biggest, I mean, if you're, for example, a, um, a major league baseball umpire, you're not allowed to step on the field unless you've had a baseline test. Now, within the NHL, the NBA, and, and the NFL, they have a collective bargaining agreement. There's union issues, so they can't force a baseline test, but it is a general practice among most teams. Our baseline testing... The whole point, taking the guesswork out of a return of play. It's not one test. It's multimodal testing. We recommend, as do the experts, yearly testing. And it is the safest and fastest return to play. Um, these are all the different tests we do within um, our baseline protocols. I've highlighted the ones in yellow are the ones I do with kids in your age group under 12, um, primarily because the other tests we don't have um, normative data established for that age group. Generally, this takes about an hour um, to cover off in uh, um, with a kid under 12 and an hour and a half, generally speaking, with, with an average kid or athlete. In summary, recovery is the most important part of a proper concussion management. And symptom resolution occurs before brain recovery occurs. That's the key thing you have to remember. And that's the biggest risk factor. Without understanding where someone was pre-injury, all return to play decisions are actually a guess. Now, when we do a return to play, we put a lot of objective measurement into it, but ultimately I can never know exactly where the, where the athlete was prior to injury without a baseline but we can get as close as we can to knowing definitively that there's not gonna be a problem, but it's still not 100% without a baseline. There is no good normative data at any age group. So comparing an injury or post-injury to what the norms are leads to a lot of miscal uh, misclassifications, miscalculations, and errors. Baseline tests are always superior. I mean, for example, one athlete on one function can function like an Einstein and the other function like the lowest in the class. And yet, but that has no bearing on intelligence. That has no bearing on anything other than just the way the brain functions. A single test is not a good baseline. Research has shown this. So there's a lot of discounted baseline testing. We're going to do one test this it's it's not a good way to go about it. Um, we need testing that has good sensitivity. Um, a single test has possible issues with rely reliability of a single item. And different tests have different purposes. So that's why um, a multimodal testing or a group of testing, because you cover off different aspects of function. So multiple tests improve these concerns and substantially. Baseline tests, again, are not needed to make a diagnosis. Symptoms and mechanism of injury are. and But when the symptoms go away, that's when a baseline test becomes useful. And again, it's recommended yearly, obviously, because an 11-year-old hopefully is cognitively more evolved than a 10-year-old, as is a 12-year-old more cognitively than an 11-year-old, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why what's recommended to do on a yearly basis because your young athlete is developing cognitively. Second of the three primary concerns is persist persistent symptoms. So also known as post-concussion or persistent, custom, con persistent concussion syndrome, there's a lot of different symptoms. These are some of the most common ones. Uh, but it can be really bad. It can, it can, not just the fact it's pain, but can because it's a brain injury, 
has a high degree of anxiety, depression, and other problems that then all leak into other aspects of life. And current research suggests that 30 to 40% of individuals suffer long-term persistent symptoms. So this is not just an obscure thing that doesn't happen very often. It's very common. So what's the key? Early intervention. In this study, athletes who are evaluated within a week of injury recovered in a mean of 20 days faster than those athletes seen within two to three weeks post-injury. So the bottom line is early intervention led to quicker recovery. And that involved um, active rehabilitation strategies, which we'll talk about more in the upcoming slides. Another study. This study adds to the literature by emphasizing the importance of early clinical care to quicker recovery and concussion and providing more evidence to support the current consensus guidelines that advocate for a short period of rest followed by graded sub-symptom activity. The earlier you get back an athlete back to activity and action, as long as it's sub-symptom, in other words, below symptoms, and definitely in no way can they be um, susceptible to re-injury or another hit, that's what's getting them back faster and less problematic. Early intervention treatment. Rest is out. Again, that was one of the things 15 years ago, dark room, be quiet. Yet um, remarkably, that's one of the number one recommendations in the average medical office or, or, or hospital. Again, that's not a slight on the, of those practitioners. The field is changing and it's changing rapidly. So if you're not into that field and you're not getting the information, it's hard to keep up. Active rehab is what's in. And this was believed to be dangerous before. And that's why it was avoided all the time. But now we know, and research is backing it up, that activity and stimulating in a sub-symptom threshold level is, is best. It's safe and it gets them back to work uh, back to work or play quicker. Rehab should start well within seven to 10 days, if not, not within the first couple of days. That could involve manual therapy, dealing with concussion, or sorry, dealing with whiplash rather, because whiplash is very, very common with most concussion. In fact, it's inevitable that if there's concussion, there's probably some related neck injury. Exercise therapy, that's one of the most important keys one of the first steps we get on to with regards to rehabilitation, getting blood flow and autonomic nervous system activity back to normal in the brain. Nutrition. Um, definitely emphasize this more with chronic or persistent concussion issues, but nutrition, the better the nutrition, the better inflammatory response and the better recovery of any injury, let alone a brain recovery. And then vestibular and vision rehab. And in addition to stuff we'll basically do in the office, I'm linked in with, as are most um, CCMI clinics, I'm linked in with a couple of different uh, optometry clinics. In fact, one of the top optometrists in North America, um, heading out dealing with um, brain related visual problems. So again, we screen for those issues and refer out if necessary for more advanced training and, and uh, rehabilitation in vision, because vision is a very common problem with concussion. It's almost always a, an aspect of concussion and sometimes can be problematic in recovery. So clinical bottom line, early sub-symptom threshold exertion exercise. It's safe, it leads to faster symptom resolution and it leads to faster return to play. And again, I'm not going to go through them all, but just to reiterate, there is tons of research coming out supporting this perspective. This isn't just an, like an out there, like this is well-supported document with research. All these aspects, safe, faster symptom resolution and faster return to play. Whiplash, again, as I said, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have some form of whiplash or neck injury with any concussion. Uh, it's most common mechanism of cause of concussion 
especially in kids because their head versus body weight is skewed versus na uh, versus an adult. Uh, it causes damage to the structure of the spine. Now, not necessarily damages to the point of causing paralysis or permanent disability, but think of it this way. When you sprain an ankle, you have different degrees of sprain, ankle sprain, but you still have some dysfunction at that angle. That's essentially what this, this is. It's a sprain of the neck and you can have various degrees of the sprain and that can involve any one of the levels or multiple levels of the neck and then the muscles and ligaments around the neck. It carries with it its own consequences aside from concussion, the least of which are headaches, balance issues, both of which are most common symptoms associated with concussion and also has some long-term health consequences. Um, it can lead to slight instabilities in the neck where there's dysfunction that leads to increased wear and tear and more arthritic changes in the neck so that a person in their 30s or 40s actually has a neck that's more like someone in their 70s with advanced arthritic changes. Also, there's research suggesting that a possible increase in susceptibility to future concussions. Now, I'm not gonna go into this tonight. The research doesn't support that increased neck strength um, necessarily protects anyone from a concussion, but proper neck function so that there's more responsiveness neurologically in motion and the neck will become more rigid quicker um, can prevent concussions and the damage to the neurological functioning in the neck with the joints not functioning properly can make someone a little bit more susceptible to repeated concussions. Consequences of whiplash, this is what I was talking about as far as on the left, showing what a normal curve. Now you're not gonna see this in your 10 year old or 12 year old or 16 year old um, right after concussion, but what'll happen over 20, 30 years is that starts to lead to a lot of dysfunction. You have a loss of normal curvature and postural curvature in the neck, and that causes abnormal wear and tear. And so the disc, which are essentially just bushings between two vertebrae, they start to wear out. And that's advanced arthritic changes, degenerative disc disease, degenerative joint disease, osteoarthritis, all of which can be prevented and avoided. So concussion treatments, um, again, rest is no longer considered to be the best approach. Active rehab as quickly as possible, starting with an assessment as soon as possible. So there's exercise therapy within my clinic, whiplash therapy, education and reassurance. We make that an important part of the first few visits. And actually is also included within the concussion track wrap, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. Diet nutrition advice, vestibular rehabilitation and basic visual rehab with referral for more advanced rehab when necessary. So out of those three primary concerns, the two most common you're gonna to have to deal with in your son or daughter is second impact syndrome and persistent syndrome symptoms. And what's the real problem with this? It's the management, or more specifically, the mismanagement of things. Injuries are commonly missed. As I said at the beginning, it's repeated in research to estimate that over 50% of concussions aren't even reported, they're missed. And then, let alone the ones that are reported, if they're not reported, they're definitely mismanaged. And so those mismanagement problems, excuse me, is what leads to all the problems we've been talking about. So one key thing in management is objectivity. Parents and coaches aren't. And most definitely athletes aren't and can never be. I mean, athletes will do anything to get back to, uh, to play. You got to think about it this way. A concussion is a brain injury. We can't ask someone with a brain injury to use their brain to make a judgment call. It's worse than asking a chronic alcoholic if they're okay to drive. It's worse than that. They've got an injured brain. They can't possibly make 
a judgment call. Their cognitive function is dysfunctional. So keys to good management. As I said, early intervention and in the assessment is the number one factor in recovery. In fact, research as I was relating to before shows that the faster an assessment is done and establishing where the problems are for the primary purpose of getting treatment involved, that's one of the biggest factors in determining how fast someone will recover from an injury. And that does not mean the emergency room. And again, I'm not cutting up the emergency room physicians. They're doing their job. Their job in ER is to determine if there's more serious health consequences, a fracture to the brain, a tearing of one of the blood vessels in the brain, causing bleeding and potential pressure on the brain. That's what they're ruling out. They're not worrying about diagnosing or treating your concussion or anything else for that matter. Their job in ER is to make sure they save lives and prevent any serious complications from happening. That's when an ER doctor's job is. So they're gonna assess and when they assess, they're determining there's no serious consequences that need immediate action and medical intervention. Then they send you off to deal with your own practitioner. That then requires assessment by a healthcare professional trained and knowledgeable in concussion management. Rest is wrong. Exercise is essential and early sub-symptom uh, exercise. An objective and measured return to play protocols. So return to play, return to learn. I mean, I'm pretty sure most organizations and schools have this. I think the most common thing is what we need to do is going through each stage is we have objective measurements of determining whether someone's at level four, level five, level six, whether they're ready to go on to level seven. We have objective guidelines to measure each stage. And medical clearance before full unrestricted practice is an objective and measured thing, not just because you saw a practitioner. It has to be measured. Otherwise, it's a complete guess. And if that guess, which is primarily based on asking Johnny how he feels, well, there's going to be problems. So last one I'll cover tonight is CTE. Now, I'm going to bring this up primarily because I know it's been talked about a lot in the media um, and also in, in entertainment. I mean, if you've ever seen this movie, I, I actually think it's a great movie. However, it's kind of misleading and very, very fearful as far as the consequence of concussion. And, you know, it goes along with this CNN high, um, um, post where CT was found in 99% of study brains from deceased NFL players. And now we know from research going on since then is, is that that's a very misleading statement. Now, I, I can bring up, again, lots of research on this. Uh, one I thought would be relevant to talking what we're talking about tonight with and with hockey is a study on former NHL players and concussions and, and not showing any signs of CTE, but actually that they're, um, they were comparing a group of ex NHL players with history of concussion versus other non-contact athletes who had no history of concussion also versus normal individuals and showing no cognitive decline or problems with the NHL players versus normal individuals. And the same thing has been shown in NFL players is that the average NFL player, the, the chances of uh, the percentage of NFL retirees with CTE versus the general population is actually less. Now there's a whole bunch of other factors that come into play, including ones that they related to that um, movie I was just talking about because a lot of those players were playing constantly in pain and were using large doses of opioids and other drugs and constantly, constantly getting injured. So there's repeat and constant inflammation and damage to the brain. And so I'm not suggesting that it's not a possibility. What I'm suggesting is not a certainty. So, I mean, the one 
the one thing I wanted to emphasize with tonight is I don't think there's a need for fear or fear or, or worry about your child playing sports, any sports, let alone, let alone contact sports. As long as concussions are managed properly, all the current research is showing it can be resolved problem-free and without any severe consequences or consequences in the future. Okay. But it's all about the key is management. And again, there was no statistical, statistical difference between the contact and non-contact athletes looking at executive function, memory, language, or perceptual motor skills. Now, there is known to be a susceptibility to younger athletes. A younger athlete takes longer to recover than, say, an adult athlete. Primarily because children and adolescents are considered to be um, still, uh, I mean, still developing. So um, it's considered to be an incomplete brain development where an injury is occurring. So the myelination, meaning the nerve formation, is not completed. The actual frontal cortex isn't completely developed until I believe it's they've determined somewhere around 26 or 27 years of age. The neck to head ratio in these kids, their head versus an adult is much larger versus the body body mass um, and lower blood brain and barrier integrity. So um, the blood brain barrier is the barrier between our, our systemic blood supply and the brain. And that's important to keep out a lot of different things, but the integrity of that is more susceptible to injury the younger the athlete. And that has been shown to be uh, part of one of the things with persistent or chronic concussion issues. Um, so a key when managing young athletes is actually hold them out longer and manage them very conservatively. I mean, the bottom line is when your 10 year old is gonna miss a couple of games, it's going to be inconsequential to their life, but putting them back too early and then leading to more serious brain injury is extremely consequential to their life, obviously. Right. Um, last thing I want to talk about is our concussion tracker. Um, it's a free app that you can go, uh, you look for this icon in the app store. And if you've got an iPhone or in the Google play store, um, it will give symptom updates, uh, recovery diet plans, return to play protocols. It allows for communication between team, parent, and clinician. Um, it has a list of all the licensed clinics dealing with uh, complete concussion management. It provides a sideline assessment for a trainer to do a sideline assessment that's not only going to be objectively measured and quantified, but then also available to the clinic clinician when the athlete goes in to get evaluated. Um, and it has different levels of clear to play, clear to practice, or held out of practice or play because of suspected or confirmed concussion. So it allows that communication. This can be done by creating a team. It can be done as a family. So a family can do it with all their kids. A team uh, can put all of their team members on it, including coaches, trainers, parents, so that there's a direct communication and anytime anyone knows where anyone on the team, any of the players on the team are, are sitting with regards to their ability to, uh, to be returned to play. And it does all things through color coordination of whether they're cleared to practice, to return to play, or they're pulled out of play. And it also indicates whether they have a current or valid baseline. So if you have a child it'll give you a reminder about when your baseline needs to occur. It provides re injury reports to inform parents, healthcare providers, as well as coaches, teachers, VPs. Um, you can view ongoing return to activity permissions. So again, communicating back to a coach or a teacher or a VP at the school, the Johnny is able to go back to school, um, go back to practice, go back to play, to tell them exactly where things are in the stage of recovery. Um, again, um, uh, we've got a new feature on it where we have some basic neurocognitive testing right on the app. Um, so even if you haven't engaged in a full um, baseline testing, 
we have at least an ability to get a, a basic baseline test done on every kid out there. And that's our goal to get baseline testing done in everybody. Cause the more baseline testing we have across the board with all organizations, sports and players is that the more objectively we can manage concussion and get people better. So on the concussion tracker app, it has injury reporting. It has two care options. You can either go to see your doctor or the healthcare practitioner um, and direct you to a certified clinic. Um, it allows every parent, coach, and teacher associated with that athlete to immediately be notified of the suspected injury. And everything, colors turn red for any athlete that's supposed to be held out or has been found to have an injury. So concussion track wrap is a key part of our management, baseline testing, concussion treatment, concussion education and awareness, uh, active and measured and quantifiable return to play and work, a concussion development program and policy development that's provided through our network of practitioners and our board of directors. We have a network across across North America, and I believe in even into Europe. And we also provide four teams, although oftentimes uh, organizations like Hockey Canada already provide a basic, but if you would like as a trainer or as a coach, we have some also education programs for free for coaches and trainers on teams. So in summary, you can't really prevent a concussion from happening other than avoiding contact. But again, that just minimizes it again, because even when 10 year olds are playing non-contact sport, they fall, they slip, head gets whipped back. They bang in each other. They bang into boards. Contact is almost always avoidable. It's not that every contact is going to lead to a concussion. So I definitely do not want to lead that belief there, but through proper management, we can prevent more serious secondary injuries. Through baseline testing and evidence-based return to play strategies. And we can prevent prolonged outcomes by initiating early care and rehab. So next steps, schedule a baseline. If your son or daughter has not had a baseline done, schedule a baseline to be done. Get it done as soon as possible. I can't tell you how often someone said, well, I'll schedule that in a couple of weeks. And then a week later, they call me because their son or daughter's concussed and now I have to evaluate them. Next thing, download that concussion tracker app and use it. It's a great tool. It's free. Take advantage of it. Email me. First of all, with any questions. Secondly, if you'd like to receive a monthly educational information um, um, post about concussion and or about general healthcare action steps, send me your email and I'll include you on that list. So thanks again for attending and we'll open up the, uh, we'll open up the floor for any questions.